Hey guys, thank you for checking out this message from Grace Church San Diego. At the center of every church lies a group of people committed to the mission of the church. Those people are called the core. At the heart of every true follower in Jesus lies a set of values, and this is the core. The core is essential for both personal and organizational success. This series will teach you how to become the core. We'd love to hear how Grace Church is affecting your life, so please send an email to info at gracesd.com with your story. Or if you'd like to help support our ministry financially, you can visit the website below so we can continue to help people find Christ and become His mature followers. Well, a lot of people live their life with regrets, so I kind of figured out a little bit about what old people think about regrets. I told somebody I was going to share that, and they said, well, you should know about it. You've got plenty of experience. Um, the uh, top regrets of old people are these. Number one, not pursuing my dreams by overcoming my fears. And uh, number two, not cultivating friendship and spending time with those friends. Number three, not expressing true feelings and being authentic uh, number four, not spending enough time with people because of work. And the final one, and I think this is really powerful, not living a life of meaning and purpose. I want to share with you this, this morning a regret minimization strategy. Uh, some of us look back over our lives and we go, wow, I have so many regrets. And I do too. And um, I have a little more experience with developing regrets than you do, most of you. Um, what I want to deal with is not what regrets you might have at the end of your life, but I want to talk about regrets that you might have after your life on this planet is over. Most of us don't think about that. We think about this lifetime, and I really want to address that. Welcome you to Grace Church. Are you glad to be here? Awesome. I'm glad both of you are here. That's awesome. Yeah, that's, you're really excited. I can tell. Uh, welcome to those of you online campus. I know it's a little warm in here, and they're nice and cool in their houses, but uh, if you'll stop producing heat because we're kind of full, uh, you know, that would be awesome. If you could turn that off, that'd be cool. I want to talk about the core life, and you're going to need a Bible uh, to follow along with us. If you don't have a Bible, just raise your hand. Our ushers uh, will come by with a Bible that you can use for this, this message, and if you'll turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6. I want to share one of my favorite passages. Do you ever ask the question, when you talk about core life, do you ever ask the question, why do some Christians thrive and other Christians suffer? And I don't mean suffer because they're being persecuted. I mean they suffer because they feel stress, they feel um, worry, uh, anger, why is it that some people thrive and some people suffer? You know, a lot of us have ambition. We want to accomplish things in this life. We want to gain more stuff, let's be honest. But ambition without purpose is the most miserable life you can have. You've got to have purpose. And so I want to share with you a stress cure. How many of you have felt stress in the last week? Raise your hand. Wow. Wow. Is it the heat or what? Uh, most of us do that. Um, I actually spent most of my life in stress and anxiety. And if I'm being honest with you, a lot of negative emotions, including anger and worry and fear. And I actually wrote a program uh, for resolving that. It used to be called Breathe 90. I've shortened it down to Breathe 60. It's a 60-day program. And if you would like to be a part of that, if you're dealing with negative emotions in your life, like anxiety or fear or, or anger or worry, uh, any of those, uh, those negative emotions, I'd love to have you join us. It's in the uh, guide that Pastor Jesse shared with you a moment ago. Uh, sign up for that. Uh, there's no shame in, in dealing with that. I dealt with it most of my life until I really looked at that, and I wrote a program and a book uh, to deal with that struggle of negative emotions. Well, one of the key things in dealing with stress is what I call the core life. And there are three elements to the core life. There's water, there's a rope, and there's a bridge. 
And then you say, what in the world does that have to do with uh, core living? And I'll explain each one of those in a minute. But the water is an interesting thing. Somebody gave me, uh, Pastor Jesse brought this up. Somebody in our church gave us these water bottles. It's called core water, which is appropriate for the series, right? Uh, the core water is some fresh water, perfect pH. I don't care. It just tastes good. Um, you ever taste some water that just, uh, it's not, it's, it's uh, potable, you can drink it, but it doesn't taste good? Have you ever had water out of the tap here in San Diego? How many like tap water here in San Diego? That's about 1%. Uh, my wife, we have bottled water, we bring it to the house and have a dispenser, and the kids love that water, and my wife still goes to the tap and drinks out tap water which is not bad for you. It just tastes a little, little weird. Kimberly and I went uh, on our vacation to Guatemala on a mission trip. Somebody said, why are you going to go on your vacation on a mission trip? Isn't that work? Well, really, what better thing are we going to do? We get to go to a, another country. We went to Guatemala and went down to this little city called Zacapa. And while we were there, we went to a mission called Hope for Life International, one of the best missions I've ever been to in my life. And uh, we did a tour of the mission there, 6,000 acres of um, mission uh, compound. And they do incredible things, feeding the poor and rescuing babies. And I'll share a little bit more about that in a moment. But uh, they have a hospital, five-story hospital. It's just, it's, it's amazing. And as we went through that, we had this opportunity to go to these villages. And we went to this one village uh, where they had just put in a new well. And if you know anything about uh, the water, in, uh, especially in the villages, the villages have water that's not just not potable. If you were to drink it, you would get sick. But they live on that water, and in that water are parasites. And those parasites destroy the health of the people that drink that water, and so it's crucial to get these wells there. And we went to a dedication of a well, and, and uh, to see this whole village of a I don't know, there's probably about seven, 800 people live in that village, but a lot of them were there for the dedication of that well. They had this, all this fresh water. They had drilled down into an aquifer and had this fresh water coming up, and it was just a beautiful thing. And we were walking away from that dedication. We were with a man named Hector, who was one of the missionaries there. And Hector grew up in Guatemala, and he had kind of a... a pensive look on his face. And I said, Hector, what's the matter? He said, you know, we're going to have to come back here. And I said, w w why is that? You've got the well. What do you need to do? And he said, well, the interesting thing is the people that live in this village have acquired a taste for the toxic water. They like the taste of it. And when they taste the spring water, it tastes horrible to them. And we have to train them. We have to explain to them that this water that they've been drinking that tastes good to them is actually toxic and it has uh, properties in it that will actually destroy the quality of their health. And he said it takes a lot of effort. We have to retrain them. And I, I think by analogy, the taste of water is very important. When I taste this, it tastes really good to me. I don't know why they call it core, but it's, uh, it's some good water. And uh, the, acquiring a taste for something is very important. Well, it takes training. And I was thinking by life application in our lives, we have a tendency to an acquired taste for ambition, an acquired taste for this life, how we can make <laughs> this life meaningful. And we do almost anything in our power, education, uh, selling and buying homes, buying properties and buying uh, vehicles and so forth, that we want to improve the quality of our life. And we want, while we live on this earth, to really live a meaningful life. And we assume that the best way to have a meaningful life is to acquire more things. And we get a taste for it. And that taste is strong. It's a big driver in our life. But we may find that those things that we desire most are really toxic to our lives. And what I would call a craving for the temporal and it, it, it seems normal, natural, and intuitive that we would want this life to be meaningful. And I don't think that's bad. 
So I want to share with you, as I said just a moment ago, a regret minimization strategy, how you can strategize your life so at the end of your life and actually beyond this life, when you finish this life, how you can have a life that is not filled with regret but is filled with reward. I don't mean regret at the end of your life that you haven't had enough stuff. I'm talking about when you stand before Christ, at the judgment seat of Christ, are you going to regret those things that you invested in? First Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 says this, but godliness with contentment is great gain. It's one of my favorite and go-to verses. I've probably preached on it uh, 10 times over the last 10 years, and I bring it up on a regular basis because I think it's so powerful. Verse 7 says, for we brought nothing into this world, and we cannot take anything out of this world. The word godliness is an interesting word. It's, uh, you know, this, uh, Paul wrote to Timothy this epistle, this letter, and he wrote it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. These are the words of God. These are the words of Christ. And he said to Timothy, he said, godliness with contentment is great gain. He had just told them that godliness was assumed by some to be gain in itself. And they thought this that if they were godly, that somehow God would feel obligated to them. If they lived, quote, a godly life, that God would be obligated to give, to give them stuff, to give them things that would enhance their temporal life. And he said, no, it's not that. It's not godliness that obligates God. But if you want the real means of gain, it's going to be godliness coupled with contentment. And the word godliness or the word godly has this idea. It's the Greek word Eusebius, and it means to be obsessed with the presence of God, to be focused on God, to look beyond everything that's going around you and in everything see God right there, in the midst of suffering to see God right there, in the midst of failure to see God right there, and in the midst of successes to see God right there. No matter what happens in your life, it is God who is present with you, Eusebius, godliness an obsession with the presence of God, a focus on the presence of God. That's what godliness, and then he says, couple that with contentment. And the word contentment is not the lack of ambition. Some people think I'm content, so I'm going to sit here and watch TV. I'm going to surf the net. I'm just going to be content. You have no ambition in your life. And some people think, well, the Christian life should never be about ambition. Ambition is not bad. But ambition without purpose is deadly. In other words, ambition where you seek to gain more power, influence, possession becomes a toxic thing to you. But ambition when it's coupled with purpose becomes contentment. In other words, you can be content in the process. All of us have dreams. We have dreams of things we want to accomplish and obtain. But when those things are attached to purpose, a purpose that is bigger than us. We have the power to be content in the process. So whatever you've accomplished today, you say, God, this is enough. I'm on a track of goals and dreams, but those are in your hands. So whatever your will is, Lord, I'm moving forward, but I will be content with what you provide along the way. That power of contentment, rather than uh, being content only when you get, you are content in the journey, in the process of accomplishment for the kingdom of God. He says, for we brought nothing into this world, and we cannot take anything out of this world. Y you carry stuff around in this world? Kimberly and I just decided, our kids are growing, you know. We got uh, our two oldest daughters are living, been out of the house for a long time, married, kids, all that. And then uh, the last five, you know, uh, Ronnie's in the Army. He's out. Uh, Shara, we just dropped her off at Seattle. I say we. I mean, Kimberly dropped her off. I stayed home and watched TV or something. Uh, but we dropped her off at school. She's training for ministry, and we're really excited about that. So she's out of the house. Malachi is training to be a firefighter. He'll be out of the house soon. Uh, he's 20 years old. Jesse is in his last year of high school, and he's going to go into the Navy next year. And, and uh, then we just have Gracie, the best, the safe, the last, our little baby girl. And she's a freshman in high school, so it's just going to be the three of us. And our house, we decided, you know, our house is too big. Uh, we don't need it anymore, so we've decided to downsize. And Kimberly, 
Kimberly's got a thing about a little baby girl. garage sales. And she's a she never so passes a garage sale. If she's driving, watch out. She breaks for every garage sale. <laughs> What's that? If you leave something on the lawn because you're fixing something in the house, she will take it. She's a thief. Now, I'm not saying my wife is a hoarder. She's a modified hoarder. Because let me show you what, how that works. So she gets all this stuff, and our house starts filling up, and she goes, okay, I need to get some. Well, now that we're selling the house, she goes, I can get rid of this, this, and this. And I'm telling you, this is no lie. Giving away and sending stuff to the dump, $800 worth of trips to the dump. I think we lost a couple of kids in that trip. But anyway, it was awesome. So we, we can get we can get rid and we realize we're carrying this stuff along and as we move to our next house we're downsizing and you can't carry it but i got to tell you when you reach the end of your life everything you've acquired your possessions your money your power your influence all of your cars all of your whatever it is it doesn't go with you it stays here for the people that are waiting for you to pass so they can have your stuff And so we realize we can't carry it with us. Why not get rid of some of that and keep the essentials? You don't take anything into the world when you were born. It was just you and your mommy. And uh, you don't take anything out. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you know to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. The moment that you die, you are in the presence of Almighty God. What a beautiful thing. But all of your cool stuff stays here. It's just the way it is. Paul goes on to explain in verse 8, but if we have food and clothing with this, we will be content. No matter where we are in our journey, we say, God, today is enough. We want the best of life, but whatever we have today, we say, it is enough. And then he goes on in verse 9. He says, but those who desire to get rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Notice the gravity of this. But before we do, just see this word desire. I highlighted here the word desire. Typically, if you're going to use the word desire, you would use the word thelo in the Greek as this was originally written or the word epithomai, which means a strong desire. But he didn't use either one of those. When Paul wrote this to Timothy in the Greek, he used this word bolomai. And the word bolomine means an intentional determination, a driving determination. It's that kind of determination that's not whimsical or impulsory. It is beyond that. It is like, I will get this, get out of my way. You ever in a crowd, you see somebody that's pushing through, pushing through, they're going to get to the other side. That guy that will push people out of the way, that's what this word means. It means I don't care about anything. I've got a driver, and that is Bulamai. I am going to get rich. I don't care who I have to step on. He's not talking about whimsical desires. and He's not talking about just human comfort. He's talking about something that's more intense than that. But he gives a warning with it, and notice four things are coupled with this desire, it results in temptation. It results in a snare. It results in senseless and harmful desires. It results that people are plunged into ruin and destruction. That snare, that trap, every temptation of life becomes your, your driver. And these are senseless and harmful desires. These are desires that actually will plunge you into ruin and destruction. And if you look at these words in the original language, ruin and destruction, they actually have the idea of being destroyed without remedy. They're toxic. This desire, this drive, this determination to get rich will result in a toxic lifestyle that will destroy you. Can you imagine the people in that village drinking that toxic water, preferring that over the fresh, clean water that could set their life and their health in a whole different plane? But they prefer what they're used to, what they've acquired into taste for. Have you acquired a taste for wealth, for position, for influence, for power? 
these things will destroy your life. I'm not suggesting that if you're wealthy that your life is ruined. What I'm suggesting is that if you're not content with what you have, it will destroy you. Some of you are wealthy, some of you are middle class, but all of you are better off than what we saw in Guatemala. I have never seen such poverty, and I've been in Thailand, I've been in all over the world, but I've especially been in Mexico and in Haiti, and I've seen poverty. But when I was in Guatemala, I saw the way that many of these people were living in these villages, and we live a life that is so superior in terms of material possession. That rich desire may not be for the richness, riches of uh, American culture, but just being better off than what you are. Can you settle down and say, God, I am content with what you've given to me for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. He's not suggesting that money is the root of all kinds of evil. He's suggesting that the desire, this drive, this love for money, this commitment, this bulimai, this determination to get rich is toxic to us spiritually and emotionally. It is through the craving that some have wandered away from faith and have pierced themselves with many pangs. That last statement, pierced through with many pangs, it just simply means there is emotional trauma when we want more than what we have without being content. If you want gain, it is godliness coupled with contentment that brings gain. And Paul makes his, his case very powerfully. Not long ago, I saw an illustration from a pastor, and I thought it was one of the most incredible illustrations I've ever seen, and that is the wrong side uh, here. This rope he talked about is our lifeline, your existence. And this little red part right here is your journey on earth. Look at all this. This is eternity. All of this goes out of sight. But we, most of us, live our lives for this red part. Some of us are here. Some of us are here. I'm down here. My good friend Bob Palmer is right there. <laughs> He's like, you know, banana grape. Ah, oh, never mind. Sorry, that's, that's wrong. He's going to live longer than I am, I'm sure. And I look at this and I think of how much effort we put into this part of our life. And you know, we do crazy things. We will do everything in our power to save, 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 save for this little part right here. So we can go, I want to travel and I want to have nice stuff right there, right there. And if you're smart, you get just enough to get you to the end so that you don't leave anything to your kids, which is awesome. We live our life for this red portion. And it's interesting that the rope represents your whole life. How much time and how much effort and how much investment have you put into all of this eternal existence that goes on and on and on, and you only care about this? And when I say you, I mean me too. I think this is a dangerous place to live. It's a dangerous way to live. I think we need to understand that living a life dependent on this lifetime is a really dangerous thing. It's that craving from the temporal to the craving for the eternal. Notice what he says in the next verse, verse 11. But as for you, O man, Timothy's talking about, O man of God, flee these things. Flee this temporal persuasion. Flee this temporal craving and pursue righteousness and godliness and faith and love, steadfastness and gentleness. Flee. That's the answer. You've got to intentionally flee from these things. These things are a trap. They're a snare. They lead many to many kinds of pangs in their life. Flee the craving of the temporal and pursue the eternal. Fight the good fight, he goes on to say, the good fight of faith. And then he says something staggering. Take hold of eternal life 
to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses, instead of grabbing a hold of this life and saying, God, it's all about this. Make me happy today. Make me happy in my lifetime. Heal my body. Fix me. Make me influential. Make me comfortable. And he says, no, take a hold of this. Grab a hold of it. And the word take hold is a powerful word because it's the word epilambano. And the word epilambano means to ek is to take a hold of or to take a hold upon, but to receive, lambano is to receive upon yourself. And sorry to get this grammar for you, but I want you to get it. In the original Greek language, there are many different uh, ways this could be used. It could be, it could be passive voice or active voice like we've got. In, in English, passive voice, you receive the action. Active voice, you do the action. But this is what's called in the Greek middle voice. And the middle voice is, yes, you do the action, but you do it in your own behalf. In other words, it's reflexing. I'm, I'm going to do this for my own benefit. What he says is, take hold of eternal life for you. As I'll show you in a moment, he says, lay store in heaven treasures for yourself, not for God, for yourself. Think beyond this life. Don't get hung up in this little section of your journey, of your eternal journey. Take hold of that which you have not seen yet. And the way that we do this, it has to be intentional, number one. It, number two, it has to be with extreme effort. And number three, it has to be enduring. It takes faith to grab a hold of eternity because we don't see it. But the regrets that you might feel at the end of your life are nothing compared to the regrets that you may feel when you are in the presence of God. What are you investing in? He said this, take hold of eternal life. Why? To which you were called. You weren't called to this life. You were called to eternity. If you're a follower of Jesus, your whole life is about eternity, not about this lifetime. That's your calling. And when you stand before the Lord, you're either going to have reward or regret. It's your choice. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14 says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. I'm looking like a runner at the end of that goal. And that goal doesn't end somewhere in this lifetime, but that goal ends at the end of this lifetime. All of my life, I'm looking down to the end of this moment, this very moment, I say, all right, God, that's what I'm focused on. That moment I pass from this life to the next in eternal life, that's what I'm taking hold of. That's what I'm focused on. And I love it what he says, Paul does to the Philippian Christians in Philippians 3.14. I press toward that. I am focused on that. That's my obsession. That's my thought. That's what I want to live for. Well, the third element, you had the water, you have the rope. But to live a core life, you have to have a bridge. When we were in Guatemala, we uh, went across this bridge. I took this picture, and I want you to see this picture. You can see a bus. This is the bus that we came in, and we came for what is called a baby rescue. These little babies are dying in villages. This little baby we rescued that day was brought across this bridge. Before this bridge was there, you can see the river under there. You can't really tell, but it is really fast moving. The current is very strong. And they used to go across on canoes and could barely make it across. But uh, Hope for Life uh, and um, uh, other ministries uh, that uh, invested in building this bridge put this bridge, World Help, I think, paid for it. And this bridge was put across. It kind of sways. It's kind of a fun bridge, you know. It's one of those that sways while you're going across. And... We saw, as we went across the bridge, and we were on this side of the bridge, we saw an ambulance come down. This ambulance was, is provided for by Hope of Life, and they took this little baby and her parents, and they brought them down to the side of this bridge on the side of what I'll call the side of death. And when I saw that little baby, I, I couldn't help but be moved. She was at death's door. Just a few months old, couldn't eat. 
Her body was filled with parasites. And those parents, you could see the anguish and the fear. They saw a bunch of Americans standing there. And it was a little overwhelming. There were cameras there and so forth. But we wanted to assure them that their baby would be safe. And those parents went from that ambulance across that bridge into that uh, ambulance on the other side. And they were taken to Hope of Life in Zacapa, brought to a five-story hospital where that baby now is beginning to thrive under medical care. And when I think of that bridge, I think of the incredible devastation of living on the side of death and on the other side is life. And I got to thinking about what Jesus said. He said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But he said, in contrast to that, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. And you know, I've been saving money for the last 30 plus years for my retirement. And uh, I've lost a lot of money over the years because of bad investments. I've actually lost more than I've gained. And, uh, you know, you have this little pool of money left at the end, and you go, okay, Lord, make it work. So he goes, all right, I got a retirement plan for you. Retirement, as I probably told you before, I'm going to retire about five years after I die. That's my retirement plan. And uh, I look at that retirement, I'm thinking, you know, how did that happen, you know? 1987, things went bad. 1998, things went bad. 2008, things went bad. Some of you lost in all of those. Most of you are too young to have lost anything in any of those. But in 2008, it was devastating when everything seemed to drop in half. And I realized the power of this verse, laying up for yourselves treasures on earth is a vulnerable place to invest. But he says in verse 20, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And notice the promise there, where there neither moth nor rust destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. You see, when you invest in heaven, that very moment when you invest in heaven, when you give money to the kingdom of God, it, it is not subject to how it's used. You gave it, and every dime that you gave went to heaven far ahead of you. And it's locked, and no one, nothing can ever take that away. No matter what happens with that money. It was given with a heart of faith. And God says, I honor that. And that is an investment in the kingdom of God. And we have all kinds of investments we make. And when you are looking at a core life investment, you go, I want to invest in this temporal life. I want to have more stuff. I want to acquire as much as I can. That's a very fragile strategy of investment. But a core life investment strategy is one that is solid because you're investing in eternity, and all of that precedes you and goes into eternity. And when you stand before the Lord, your life is filled with purpose and meaning, and you don't have regret, you have reward. I had a dream several years ago, and this dream was, as God expanded this ministry here in North Park, that God would possibly take us to five locations and give us five campuses. And a dream is just a dream. Everybody has a dream. I had a, you know, some of us dream we're going to be better looking one day. Trust me, it doesn't get any better. This is it, man. But, you know, as, as time goes on, some of those dreams don't happen. And I'm not saying that we're going to have five locations, but that's the dream. But a dream sometimes becomes a vision, and that vision is communicated. And I shared with you uh, last year a vision of planting our first campus. And so we began the process of looking for a campus, and that, that vision became a goal. And the goal was to plant that first campus, that second campus, in East County. And we looked at uh, possible places where we might be able to meet, and I was frustrated as I looked at places in East County, and I had real estate agents looking at that and commercial real estate agents and looking for commercial buildings. And we looked at everything from uh, 
uh, theaters to schools to uh, abandoned buildings. We looked at everything. You have to have CUPs, conditional use permits, to put a church in a place. And it's just like, it's so frustrating. I'm like, Lord, what are you doing? And so that vision looked like it would never become a goal. And then God did something miraculous several months ago. He opened up the door for something we started negotiating on a piece of property in a business park that has permanent CUPs for 40,000 square feet. And those 40,000 square feet are already at CUPs for church. And we are able to get in that, and we've signed contracts this last week, and we will be getting into that facility in January, and we will have a church planted there, and we will reach people for Jesus Christ. Amen? Because you've been giving. Your giving is incredible because last year, we looked at our giving from last year to this year, and we've seen a 50% increase in our general fund. That doesn't mention the Vision 2020 giving. It's been incredible. On top of that, you've been giving to Vision 2020. I don't come with you asking you to be generous. You already are. But some of you haven't gotten on that place, and you want to make that uh, an opportunity because now that goal is turning into a reality. So we went from a dream to a vision to a goal, and now it's a reality. Lord willing, on January, we'll have the reality of a new campus, and we will reach new people for Jesus Christ. We aren't doing that because we have three to 500 people living out there right now so that they can have a shorter trip to church. We're doing it so we can reach that neighborhood. Our staff is going to go to every home in that neighborhood, door to door. They'll think we're Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons or somebody. <laughs> and we're going to share with them the vision of this new church. We're going to send mailers into that community when we're ready to do our hard launch next year. And God has, has blessed this dream and blessed this vision, and the goal is becoming a reality. And we need to raise $200,000 in the next six months. Yes, we could get by with what the Lord has already provided and is providing, but if we could have another $200,000, we could expand beyond what we've been able to do. And so I want to challenge you, and I believe you can do this. Our giving has been amazing. In your program, there is this card. It says, Vision 2020, make my mark. A mark, one mark is $100 a month for 12 months. That's one mark. $1,200 over 12 months. Maybe you could do a half a mark, $50 a month, or a quarter mark, $25 a month. Most of you have been going to this church for a long time. You go, man, it's weird. You never talk about money. Well, you know what? If I don't tell you the, the vision, the dream, and the goal, uh, we won't reach it because it takes your generous gifts. And I just want to encourage you, as God lays it on your heart, has God given you resources that you can give be above and beyond your regular giving to give to this? If you are not in that position, I don't want you to feel bad. You know, somebody said to me one day, all I can give is $5, and they give it every month. And I say, that's awesome. And, you know, whatever you can give, if God lays it on your heart, I want to call you, I want you to be a part of that. I want you to be a part of this vision, a part of this dream, a part of this goal, and so that we can see this reality of reaching hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and even thousands of new people for Christ. We are now over 3,000 people that go to this church. We want to see even more, but we want it to be in a community environment like this. So we don't want a big mega church with 4,000, 5,000 seats. We want to get to know each other. And this is the way we can do it in this kind of an environment. So if you'll prayer, prayerfully consider that, because God, I believe, by his will, is going to establish Great Church East. And he's going to do it by our generous giving. And I thank you for how you've been giving. Let me close this message with just one final thought. This bridge doesn't just represent on the one side disease and death of a human being and on the other side is life and health for that family. But it also represents for me something that God did that was a beautiful thing. He realized when man sinned that there was no way that man could reach God, that there is no way for man in his own effort to get across that river. The current is too strong. You could try to swim it, but you couldn't make it. 
And so out of his love, he said, I don't need you to work for it. In fact, I'll do everything you can in this simple verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall never perish but have everlasting life. If you're standing on this side, you can cross this bridge. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me, but he is the bridge. If you'll believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you'll receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will walk across that bridge into the arms of Jesus and have eternal life. This life can be yours right now, right where you sit. This is our message. This is our hope that life has come to us from God through his son, Jesus Christ. This gift is a free gift. He said, it's not of works, lest any man should boast, but it is of faith so that nobody will say, I did it. It's a faith ministry. The wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That gift is eternal life. That bridge is yours to walk across. You can do it right now. Would you bow your head?